So today we're talking about a kidnapped sheep and a man pointing his bony finger at a king and then a public disgrace. So Nathan is the prophet and he's confronting David. And that's what we're going to be talking about today on HC Daily. Mm -hmm. You're listening to another episode of HC Daily, a daily devotional podcast that you can listen to at home or on the go. We believe that you can grow as much as you want to grow spiritually, and this podcast can be a part of your daily growth plan. So, whether you're watching on YouTube, listening on Spotify, or your favorite podcast app, we're glad you're here. Now, let's join our hosts, Jeff Forrester and Chris Zarbaugh in the studio. So, Chris, yes. we are very excited about asking this question today. Oh, we are. Okay, so um, you've had a quite adventurous life. You've gotten yourself caught up in all kinds of pretty crazy events. Zany. So what we want to know is, what is your best scar? Oh, scar. Yeah. Not not emotional uh, scar. I'm yeah. not talking about emotional scar. I'm <laughs> like, like so physical. many emotional scars. <laughs> yeah, I know. Don't whine. It's a glass gaze of emotion. <laughs> right. Navel gazer. Uh, right. Uh, what, what we're saying is like physical scar. What's your best physical yeah, scar? Yeah, so um, I would have to say uh, my best one is the one right here on my chin. Mm. You can see it through my little uh, white, Stubble. white beard. You can mm-hmm. see it better when it was black. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was six years old, and um, I didn't know how to ride a bike without training wheels. Uh, but I was bragging to Johnny Premick that I could. Mm-hmm. And so we, he lived at the top of the hill of Coleman Drive. I lived at the bottom. And I and I said, not only could I ride, I said, but you could jump on back. And he was like <laughs> twice the man I was, twice the boy I was. He was a big old guy. Well, he jumped on the back. I don't know what I was thinking. And I made it down like three houses. And I was really doing well. And all of a sudden, the bike went, and then I fell down. And uh, his whole weight of his body went on my head. <laughs> <laughs> and so I literally skidded uh, on the cement, and I tore up my chin. Mm. And my mom was uh, studying to be a nurse. She was at the hospital. My brother pulled me out, and, and her knees were like rubber when she saw my the blood everywhere. My chin was ripped open. And, and let me just wrap up the story by saying this, is that I had a Cookie Monster shirt on. Mm. And it was it was like silk in the front. like it was, it was my kindergarten shirt that I got my pictures taken in. Wow. And, a silk cookie monster shirt. And, and I was crying. And then my father showed up at the hospital and said, you can still wear your shirt, cookie monster. You can just tell people he has bloodshot eyes. Oh, no. Yeah, which I laughed. Yes. And he uh-huh. made me laugh. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there it is. Wow. So did you have to get a bunch of stitches? 12 stitches. 12 stitches. Yeah. Wow. Not That's too a- bad. I was hoping you'd have like a more of a tough guy story about stitches, but hey. Well, I, know, do, I do Cookie have monster one, shirts and bicycles. I do have one good. that I can't tell. Well. <laughs> It's true. Okay, that's the next I, yeah, question I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> okay. Plead the fifth. So uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12 is where we're at. Yep. Yesterday we talked about uh, David and Bathsheba and David doing the shocking uh, thing that nobody would thought he'd ever do. And he winds up having an affair with uh, Bathsheba. Really, he leverages it. It's probably more of a rape, quite honestly. He mm. leverages his power as a king. She can't say no. Right. Um, he winds up killing her husband, who's one of his loyal, mighty men. And, um, you know, he, he gets and, her pregnant. And he marries her. Yeah. So then he marries her. So then here we're picking up uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12. It's the very next verse. It says, so the Lord sent Nathan, the prophet, to tell David this story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he'd bought. He raised that little lamb, and it grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day, a guest arrived in the home of the rich man, but instead of killing an animal for his own flock or his own herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are that man. The Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, uh, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says, because of what you've done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. And you did it secretly 
but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of all of Israel. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you and you won't die for this sin. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord by doing this, your child will die. After Nathan returned to his home, the Lord sent a deadly illness to the child of David and Uriah's wife, and David begged God to spare the child. He went without food and lay all night on the bare ground, and the elders of his household pleaded with him to get up and to eat with them, but he refused. Then on the seventh day, the child died. David's advisors were afraid to tell him. He wouldn't listen to, the, to reason while the child was ill. They said, what drastic thing will he do when we tell him the child is dead? When David saw them whispering, he realized what had happened. Is the child dead? He asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground and washed himself, put on lotions and changed his clothes. He went to the tabernacle and worshiped the Lord. And after that, he returned to the palace and was served food and ate. His advisors were amazed. We don't understand you, they told him. While the child was living, you wept and refused to eat. But now that the child is dead... You've stopped your mourning and are eating again. David replied, I fasted and wept while the child was alive, for I said, Perhaps the Lord will be gracious to me and let the child live. But why should I fast when he is dead? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him one day, but he cannot return to me. Then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and slept with her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and David named him Solomon. Mm. So that's great. So, um, I mean, great that... uh, I mean, it wasn't great, but... Uh, well, it's great that, Dave, that that Nathan had the courage to confront David, because nobody else would speak up to David. Yeah, I, I, I say great, but then I sort of, you know, winced at the word. Uh, but great meaning, meaning that I love how God used Nathan in this way. I love the brilliance of the comparison of this story. You know, the, there's, a, there's a man that has one little lamb that he treated like a daughter, and it's the only lamb he had, and the rich man goes and takes it, and David gets furious and then, you know, Nathan points his finger, you know, we're, we're, we're guessing he pointed his finger. Yeah, yeah. And he says, you are the man. Right. You know, and the old King James Version says, thou art the man. Yeah, what a courageous oh, yeah. man of God in that oh, moment. Oh, jeez. And he did this publicly in front well, of the court. Well, do you remember when when they they just came and announced to David, hey, guess what? Your enemy Saul was killed. Mm. And David killed the, the messenger. Right. Right? This is David. Right. And then now he comes in and goes, you're the man. And sticks his finger right in David's yeah. face. Ooh. Well, he's he knows he has God in his side, Nathan the prophet, yeah. and he and he believes that David still loves Jesus or loves God, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, and so he's he's banking on that. Uh, which, by the way, I might tell you a story if if it's relevant later about that. But um, but I'm so engrossed yes. in the story that uh, so uh, let's talk about this for a minute. I think that his servants didn't quite get it. His servants didn't look at it from a godly perspective at all. Because all the servants was thinking is like, hey, if the child's still living, you're this sad. So if the child dies, you should be this sad, which is more right. sad. Right. Right. They weren't thinking it in consequences of like what David was actually doing. Right. David was throwing it at the feet of God, uh, fasting and praying to change the mind of God. Mm-hmm. And God's mind would not be changed. Mm-hmm. The consequences of David's sin uh, ended with the child's life. And so then David gets up and he decides, okay, that, uh, I'm going to accept God's uh, you know, consequences. Right. And I'm going to, and, and they're confused. And I thought to myself, I think they're confused because they weren't looking at it at all as if it were in God's hands. Right. They were just looking at it from a normal morning perspective. Yes. This is one of those passages, by the way, that sometimes um, I found myself referencing when somebody comes and asks me, what happens when uh, a baby dies? Mm. Right. Where does it, where does the baby go? And he says, I'll see him again. Yeah, he, he says here, he said, I, uh, the, uh, the baby will never come back to me, but mm. someday I'll go where he is. And David definitely had a sense that this child went to God, mm-hmm. right? That, that, was his, that was his sense here, right. his belief. And I think he's saying this, you know, this is recorded in Scripture. It's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And David was one that God used to write much of the Bible, much of the Old Testament, the That's whole book right. of Psalms. So here's a guy who is speaking from the Holy Spirit, and he's speaking, saying, this infant uh, went to God. Mm-hmm. Now, this baby, according to the Life Application Study notes, it was about a year after his sin with Bathsheba. So this probably was a, a not quite a toddler yet, you know, a less than a year old mm-hmm. uh, child, a few months old maybe, um, child. And so it wasn't a baby, it wasn't a person who 
knew what sin was, didn't have any con- any concept of God or of, you know. And so I think it's it's a similar maybe attitude or thought when we talk about the idea of the maybe the age of accountability. That that phrase mm-hmm. isn't in scripture, but we kind of get the concept here that here's an infant that had no moral understanding and no concept of a God. So this could also be maybe uh, even adults with special needs mm-hmm. that don't ha- have the ability to know the difference between right and wrong, that kind of thing. When you ask, what does God do with one of those babies? David had a sense that this simple child was with God. Yeah, and, and it, it has to be said as well that because uh, the majority, especially in the area that we live in, I would say the majority of people uh, have grown up with the tradition and they know the importance of, at least they were told the importance of, baptizing an infant, right? right? right. And so maybe you grew up like I did in a mm-hmm. faith where it, there were people just insisted, you have to get your baby baptized. Well, I mean, in the faith that I grew up in, uh, you know, it, it just depends on where you believe the authority comes from. Right. You know, do you believe the authority comes from the Bible, uh, the complete and written word of God given to us from God to us? Or do you believe the authority lies within the church? Uh, if a pastor can speak on and behalf of... And when you say of, within the church, you're talking about within church traditions and well, within church leadership. Church leadership. Yeah. Because there are some denominations, uh, particularly you know, the most dominant one, mm-hmm. that says when we speak, we speak on behalf of God. Right. As if God himself has spoken. Right. Right. So it, it, that's really where the difference lies. It, de- it depends on where you, where you believe the authority comes from. So just so you'll know, uh, in the faith I grew up in, the tradition of baby baptism came with them trying to answer the question, do babies go to heaven? Right. And so what they did was, and, and by the way, most people do not know this part of it. They just believe, they're, they're very emotional, I have to get my baby baptized. They don't really truly understand the theology behind the origin of that statement. The origin of that statement is uh, that they believe, that you know, the, the, the priests believe that they have the power to remove the original sin of Adam, mm-hmm. right? And so they say, oh, we baptize this infinite infant, that, that the original sin of Adam is removed. If you think about that concept... It's kind of, uh, even if that were to be true, that would assume that that baby wouldn't sin again until it received Christ. Right. Which, if you've ever talked to a toddler and said, share your toys, no! Right. And you're like, was that a sin? Because I'm pretty sure our sinful nature comes out pretty early. Oh, yeah. And so to remove the original sin of Adam and then expect that baby to be covered until that baby's faith becomes their own even by itself, is such a uh, a hard-to-grasp concept. Yeah. Anyway, all that to say... Let's my, little, re- my little girl was four years old. She put her hands on her hips, looked me right in the eye, and said, I'm so sick of you thinking you can tell me what to do all the time. <laughs> she was four. <laughs> right, 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 right. Hey, listen, she still had her original sin in her, right? Right, right. So the, the, there is nowhere in the Bible, right? nowhere in Scripture that has the idea that um, a, a baby has to be baptized for the sake of having its no, sins forgiven. No, It just doesn't exist. So it's, it's, just, it's a tradition right. that men made up, and Jesus warns us about men's traditions. Mm-hmm. We should just go back to what the Bible says. So that's kind of a parenthetical from the big picture in this passage. Yeah, of course. In this passage, I just wanted certainly. to, you yeah. know, we, we talked about babies going yeah, to heaven, mm-hmm. and so I just had to throw that in there. Yep. So, so again, just to, be, just to put a bow on that, uh, every single time a, a person gets baptized, it's it's after that person right. has made a personal decision based on their complete understanding that Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose from the grave, that that's the, that's the event that we put our faith and trust in, and then they're baptized every time in the Bible. Right? So you have a year after David's sin, roughly, and Nathan confronts him with a story. Yeah. What a courageous thing. This is what a prophet does. This is what a man of God does. A man of God goes and gives God's word to, to people, regardless of what the potential outcome is going to be or regardless of consequences. And he tells a story, and David is so jaded by his own sin, he doesn't realize the story is about him. Right. And that's what sin does to us. We start to we minimize how bad our sin is. Mm-hmm. We just get used to it. We get comfortable with it. It's not a big deal. But he's horrified by this fake story guy. Yeah. He's so mad he wants this guy put to death and, and four times the amount given back to this guy. Yeah. He's just incensed with the audacity of this jerk to go take a land Because he's somebody. able to see it in somebody else. Well, but he, he was a shepherd. S- yeah. Oh, that's right. He was a shepherd. Yeah, I never he, even thought he, about he that. He knew it was like to hold a baby lamb and to love a baby lamb like a family member. He right. knew it. And man, he was furious with this jerk of a rich guy because I don't think David thought of himself as a rich guy. David's mm. still a shepherd. Right, mm. 
And and I don't think he he he. So it's so easy for us to see the sin in others and not to see our own. And then when he goes, "You are the man," I just want to say there's some real power in a godly person getting the attention of somebody we love or care about in their sin, and then saying, "You're the one in the wrong." It's a sin. There's something about that, and I think that we we have to do it gently and with respect. But this confrontation was very much to the point. It wasn't a passive-aggressive conversation with David. Chit-chat, chit-chat, chit-chat. He didn't just tell a story about a rich man stealing a lamb. Mm-hmm. He, he takes it right to the end and says, you're this guy. Yeah. And by the way, my brain always goes to the judgy Christian who has no business sticking their nose in other people's business sure, sure. And, and does it in a way that is offensive and just hurts the name of Christ all day long. So I would just say in this context, Nathan was the proper authority. To do so, right? So in other words, he, he would have been sort of David's pastor. He, he's the one, the, the spiritual guide, perhaps, right? Perhaps, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. perhaps. Uh, he would have been the spiritual guide. Well, he's the, he's the prophet, and, and so he's, he's, the, he's the spiritual one that, that he looks to. So, so in other words, like he's, he's an expected authority, and not to mention, um, you know... Uh, I, I would say a parent could do this. I think a friend could. I think you could come yeah. and say, Jeff, let me tell you a story. I respond in a, oh, that's terrible. Yeah. And then you go, I'm kind of seeing this in well, your life. That was my second half. I was going to say, or in the context of love. Yes. Right. So, yeah. so authority is also parent. Right. But, but always in the context, context of, of love. love. And that, that's where, uh, you know, Peter and others tell us with gentleness and respect, mm-hmm. Jesus, grace and truth. Right. Right. It has to be both. So it has to be from love, not just judgment from love. And then, then there's this confrontation. So then he's shaken out of his understanding of what he had done. And he confesses, mm. right? And, and you know, David wrote a hundred-something songs. There, and the Psalms in the Bible, they're all prayers that yeah. music was, was, mm-hmm. was written to because David was an author. Psalm 51 is his response to this. I, yeah. I'm just going to read it. Uh, it's several more verses, but man, is this powerful. This is the appropriate response. He's the king and could have had Nathan killed. And instead, when he's confronted with his own sin there's still that spiritual side of David and he he immediately repents. He says, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins, wash me clean from my guilt, purify me from my sin, for I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night against you and you alone have I sinned. I've done what is evil in your sight. You will prove what is right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me, but you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore for me the joy of your salvation, and make me willing to obey you. And then I will teach your ways to rebels, and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God, who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth may praise you. You do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. Look with favor on Zion and help her rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, and then you will be pleased with sacrifices offered in the right spirit, with burnt offerings and whole offerings, and bulls will will again be sacrificed on your altar. So David's response was not to smack Nathan and throw him in prison and have him beheaded. Nathan's, er, David's response was to acknowledge this is my own fault and I've only sinned against you, God. Yeah, I've sinned against you, God, and you alone. Right. So he, what he's really saying is ultimately that's that's where it was, even though he knows he sinned against a lot of different people. Including oh, he sinned against Bathsheba. He Uriah. killed Uriah. Yeah, yeah. But ultimately all sin is an affront against God. It's an attack on God. Right. That's what he's saying. He's saying priority yeah. is, 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 you know, you're the one that I've sinned against. Uh, even though that his direct actions were with people. And, and I, I can't think of a better place in the entire Bible for us to understand the appropriate response to when we're confronted with sin. No, I agree. We want to fight. We want to protect ourselves. We, we want to try to salvage something out of it. We want to blame somebody else. We want to, oh, if she hadn't been bathing on the roof, if, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. My, my knee was hurting. I couldn't go to battle, <laughs> whatever. We want to yeah. blame all these things. And he didn't do any of that as the king. He stepped up and took it. He took it right on the chin, and he fell to his knees and repented to God. 
So when I worked at my first church right out of Bible college for about eight and a half years, I uh, discovered that my pastor, uh, you know, had this immoral mm-hmm. thing that's happened, you know, just terrible. And I confronted him about it, and it eventually led to me resigning. And then afterwards, uh, I was worked at this other church locally for three and a half years, and then I went to Michigan. Well, he had heard that I was coming to Michigan, so he had called me and said, hey, should we meet up? And, you know, we had this tension between us because of, of everything that had happened. And so here's what he did is he met me in a Best Buy parking lot. He says, uh, how about if we meet in the Best Buy parking lot? And I said, well, why don't we meet in Waffle House? And he says, well, I want to be alone when we talk. He says, there's, there's a parking lot of a Best Buy. I said, well, that sounds like like someplace to get ambushed. And I was like, you know, like <laughs> my cousins would meet somebody in the back of an alley at <laughs> right. a Best Buy parking lot. So anyway, we met and uh, he was a bigger guy, six foot one. And, you know, bench probably like three, 320. Well, he grabbed my truck and he started shaking it because he was so angry. And he was saying like, you know, when you left the church and when all that stuff went down, he's like, you know, why, why did you have to tell people, you know, all these different things about what was going on? And I looked at him and I go, why didn't you just say, I'm sorry? Like, why didn't you just say, yes, it's true. Right. Yes. I had this moral thing happen because I said, do you do realize he lied the entire time. He he wouldn't admit it, mm. and he fought and fought and fought, and then the church split. It was just a huge mess. Yeah. And I said, you do realize, had you just said, I, I recognize my sin and I repent, they would have probably kept you as a pastor mm. because it wasn't a sin to throw you out. Mm. It was a sin to say, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll give you some restoration. Right. That's what it would have been. And so, But he didn't get it. Wow. And so it was the opposite of Psalm 51. So he, so he tore it all apart. He tore it all apart. Right? Yeah, which leads into the... I which, think the, the, which, by the way, David could have done. Absolutely. Which I think leads into the final thought here, and, and it's this. Um, David didn't continue to dwell on his sin. He confessed it. Right. God forgave it. Nathan said, your sins are forgiven. Now, there's going to be some consequences. Right. What we want is we want to confess to God and not have any consequences. There's right. consequences. The, the family's going to have some struggles from this point on, certainly. But uh, David then... Um, David and Bathsheba have another son named Solomon... God says, you know, life goes on, it continues, uh, and so David named him Solomon. Uh, God said his other name is Jedidiah. Jedidiah, Jedidiah means, was it, beloved of the Lord. Mm. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So here, here's a woman David shouldn't have even had as a wife, mm. and they lose a child, and then God gives him another one, Solomon, and he says, I want you to call him beloved of the Lord. And yeah. so God doesn't keep dwelling on your sin either. There's consequences. You're free to make any choice you want to make. You're not free to choose the consequences. His family's a violent family. He's living in violence. But uh, God didn't give up on his family. And by the way, that's further proof that a couple podcasts ago, when when uh, when it was get, when the promise was given to David that, about his bloodline, mm-hmm. uh, he said, "I will never take the Holy Spirit from you." Right, right. Like I did Saul because of right. his actions or his sins. Right. And so this is yet just another reminder that God can keep his promises when it comes to the forgiveness of our sins. Right. We can always bank on it. Yes. That's why, by the way, the psalm you just read, Psalm 51, he says, take not your Holy Spirit from me. That's right. Because he was because he, he saw that in Saul. That's what he was afraid of. That's what he was afraid yeah, of. Yeah. But yet God promised yeah. that he would forgive his sin. That's powerful. All right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and see you uh, tomorrow. Thank you for joining us today. If you enjoyed this podcast, please help us spread the word by liking this episode and sharing it on your social media platforms. Be sure to leave a comment and review, and don't forget to give us five stars. When you do, you help us reach even more people who need a daily devotional like HC Daily. If you'd like to hear more from Chris and Jeff, they're both teaching pastors at Heritage Church located in Southeast Michigan. You can get more of their messages by clicking on the Messages tab at HeritageChurch.com. Be sure to join us again soon for another episode of HC Daily.